Done. All right. Welcome, everyone. I think we should be live. I hope we're live. I'm David, developer advocate here at Bellina, and we are talking Laura Gateway construction today. Um, it's yet another topic that I do not know too much about, so I'm looking forward to learning. Um, for anyone joining, by all means, if uh, you have any questions, post them into the chat, and I'll get them filtered through to our guests. Speaking of guests, let's go around the virtual room. And uh, John, you want to say a quick hello? Sure. I'm John Tonello. I'm technical marketing lead here at Bellina. And uh, I was guest host last week trying to fill the big shoes of David. So <laughs> I, I know there were a lot of comments last week of, where's David? Yeah. Here he is. He's back. I'm back. I was here last week. I was just behind the scenes, not on camera. I was. I had a very important role of putting the YouTube comments on the screen so that everybody could see them. It was, you know, mm -hmm. big shoes to fill that uh, Andrew and Chris awesome, usually actually. do. Yeah, very <laughs> important. <laughs> and My I see feelings some, weren't hurt. Yeah, it's all right. I see comments already rolling in uh, <laughs> from the crew. <laughs> Uh, Mark, you want to say hello? Hey, hello. Uh, this is Mark, a developer advocate at Valena, uh, based in Europe, uh, nearby Barcelona right now, with some power outage here. So I hope that, uh, yeah, I will uh, have electricity during the IoT happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, as long as your electricity stays up, uh, you'll be joining us for a Laura build. If your electricity dies, uh, well, then it's going to fall on our special guest. Jose, you want to take a moment to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jose Marcelino. I'm uh, I'm here in the UK now. It's a bit sunny today, <laughs> strangely. Uh, I'm a solutions architect at Rack Wireless, who does a lot of LoRa stuff, lots of gateways and nodes. So yeah, we'll be talking about that. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Well, um, I think we are probably all set to get going then. Um, I usually like to open up with a quick segment I call What's on Your Desk? And uh, oh, there's... There's our new banner. Now, Chris isn't with us to sing us our song this week, so we don't have any music. But um, I will show off something I got. Oh, hang on. I need to turn off. There we go. That I found cheap on eBay. This is a 96 boards device. This is, a, as usual, I'm fascinated by tiny computers. This is a Rock 960. So this is a, you know, uh, a single board computer, just like any of the others that are out there. But this one has a rock chip RK3399 uh, SOC on it. And as usual, I am going to make an attempt at running Bellina OS on it. And most of my experiments um, end up in failure only because I'm not quite skilled enough with my Yocto recipes, but uh, I'll give it a go. And if it works out, um, we can show it off in a future episode. What kind of processing power does that thing have? So that's a little bit stronger than, well, I shouldn't say a little bit. It's a lot stronger than a Raspberry Pi 3 because a Pi 3 has Cortex A53 cores on it. This has a pair of Cortex A72 cores. But now thinking about that more, the Raspberry Pi 4 is a quad Cortex A72, so I'm not entirely sure. So it should be somewhere in the vicinity of a Pi 4 class device. This one has two gigs of RAM and 16 gigs of eMMC on it, though. The onboard eMMC is nice so that you don't have to use an SD card. So we'll, we'll see where that ends up. All right, John, you have anything on your desk? No. Uh, I have a I have a mess of different <laughs> stuff, but uh, hey, you know we had a, a cable discussion the other day on FlowDoc, and uh, everybody was showing off their cable retention and uh, organizational stuff, and it it made me realize what a slob I am. 
<laughs> All right. Well, I actually enjoy messy desks, so that's okay. Um, Jose, you got anything interesting over there on, on your desk? Yeah, I think I have some stuff here. Uh, yeah? Let me just change my camera. Um, let's see. Yeah, looking forward to see a stable, actually. Yeah, I can only imagine what might be on his. Mm, give me a moment. Just that's turning right. it on. Um, one second. Mm. Yeah, Chris is uh, cleaning his uh, table. What's going on, Chris? Mm. What is happening? Oh, technical <laughs> problem. Technical problem. Maybe we better go to we better go to Mark's. Mark, what's on your desk? Sure. Yeah. So actually. Yeah, I, I'm gonna. So actually, I'm, we are gonna use a rack. Uh, Pine Hat so actually comes with this UFL antenna. So actually, I'm gonna test live on during this IoT happy hour. I don't know. Maybe Jose will be able to talk more about uh, LoRa antennas or mm. or whatever LP1 antennas. So I'm gonna test this one. Uh, that I don't know. I'm not an expert on that. So maybe Jose can tell us more. Mm -hmm. And actually, inspired by Andrew, who didn't show up today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to test this week this. So I have on my table a couple of these Chinese, like $1 um, moisture sensor um, ah. that I want to test uh, with the LoRa devices that I'm going to show you. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So you put that out into the garden um, and then you can yeah, detect, exactly. you know, uh, uh, the soil. Um, uh, they come in other ones as well, right? pH, I think you can get uh, obviously moisture. And then I think there's one or two others out there maybe I've seen. Yeah, neat. Um, all right. Yeah, for one dollar, you kind of get. Yeah, for a dollar, that's perfect. That's a really cool, um, really cool little thing. All right, and then Jose, let's see. Did we get you? Yeah, I've got my desk now. If you want to have a look. Uh, uh, there yeah. it goes. <laughs> okay, so this is my very tidy desk at the moment. Yeah, that's uh, all right. What are we looking this at? Is this is what I'm working on now. It's a node device uh, using modular. So it's, you just connect different sensors. These are these tiny boards are sensors. This this board is a communication and microcontroller. And then you can add the battery uh, and some expansion I/O, whatever you want. So the idea is you can use this to turn it into a real product, like like this device. This is a solar powered Modbus. Um, with LoRa on, so I'll just show you how it works very quickly. Uh, so take this off. Wow, it's solar power. Nice. Yeah, it's solar powered, so the so it's got a battery as well, of course. Uh, it's a nice, then, it's a nice then case. The, um, wow. Yeah, it's a yeah. IP rated it's case. Like IP sixty so, some sixty seven or sixty five. It's sixty seven. Yeah, you can. Uh, so let me. Let me get this screws off. Yeah, screws off on IoT Happy Hour, huh? Yeah, wow, so look at this. A little, little tear, tear down, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's automatic? Oh, that's yeah, wait a minute. Was that, a screw, was that screwdriver battery powered? Yeah, of course it is. And it's got a display as well, everything. <laughs> it's all IoT, all IoT all the time. Wait a minute, uh, wait a minute, we're going to go back to the <laughs> screwdriver, I need to see that screwdriver. Yeah, this is a kind of a cool screwdriver I got from uh, from China. So it runs uh, runs firmware, uh, it's open source as well, so you can, it's got an accelerometer, so if you uh, press this button and then rotate, uh, that's not, I'm not pressing the button, so you can oh see, and then you can change the direction to different speeds depending on the rotation you're doing so yeah wow. very cool can we get we need a link to that. yeah we need a link i was gonna we say need a link yeah, yeah okay i will i will supply it afterwards that qualifies <laughs> for what's on your desk yep <laughs> uh and now back to the device this is the well, so this is the same board but put on a, an actual device and this is something rack is now selling commercially as well so you can buy but it's um so module you can change it afterwards if you don't want this particular module you want to use something else you just replace that no soldering required so it's a nice way to do development so yeah this is what i'm working on now and uh so for a 
release very soon, next month. Wow. Okay. So that's that is pretty cool. We may have tell us more to... about that. Yeah, that's I was going to say Laura the from what? space. The yeah. So the Laura from space. This is a. Uh, we are working with Lacuna Space. This Lacuna Space currently has a satellite uh, on around the Earth, and it's basically a LoRa gateway in space. So you can uh, your nodes can send data to there um, once a day when it's over when the satellite passes over your sensor, uh, and then you get the data uh, back normally through TTN or TTI. Which so it's like a terrestrial gateway, but it's in space. It's really cool. And it uses uh, the same power level and everything. So uh, using LoRa, it's uh, it's so easy. You don't need to do any big changes. You just use a different antenna. That's all. Interesting. Well, we're going to have to get into that because I, I certainly have some questions queued up about uh, the range for LoRa. So we're going to get into that. And I think actually at this point, yeah. we can probably transition. That was probably... <laughs> <laughs> the IoT screwdriver may have been our absolute best what's on your desk segment ever. Uh, I, I don't know. I think you just uh, set the bar real high with that one. I'm not sure we're going to be able to top that. So, um, so you know, on that topic of range, um, I know that Laura is a um, is a low bandwidth but long range technology that's sort of what it is designed for um what's the current um i guess world record or what are people um what are people typically seeing versus what is the maximum that you can see um from a device um yeah so i think the maximum range so far has been around 800 kilometers um so the idea is uh, the the higher the ant the antenna is, uh, it's the the better range you get. So people have uh, achieved very long ranges by using, for example, balloons uh, sort of, uh, around the Earth. Um, that's one way, or just have um, a very tall uh, gateway, it's like on a communication mast, something like that. You can achieve uh, very long distances. Um, so it's around low, low power yeah. and long range, is that? That's right. That's that's what Laura means. It's long range, LO for long run range. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and how, do, how does it accomplish the long range? I mean, is there a certain um, bit of yeah. drum that it's using? Yeah, so it uses all the tricks in the book from the RF side. So it, uh, ev everything, they throw everything. So it uses a particular modulation to achieve this. They also do a lot of... Um, error correction codes involved. Um, so they, they basically transmit under the noise floor. This is the, the physical limit for the transmission. Um, and yeah, that's that's how they achieve very, very long distances at low power. So they go they go below the noise so the the where you usually wouldn't be able to uh, decode data anymore. They, they, so that's how it, but yeah, they use everything in the book. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. So I'm Very looking. Cool. So Mark actually pulled up. The current record is 832 kilometers, which is 517 miles. Uh, yep. uh, in, in proper correct units. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. So, 830 sounds better. Yeah, 830 kilometers. So. <sighs> Trying to but that's but yeah. actually that's with a balloon, and I think it was like uh, thirty kilometers, right, uh, on the stratosphere. The balloon, is that correct? Uh, hmm. I think so. That one was, uh, I think so. We kind of start here, Flo, uh, yeah, talking we... about that Sigfox reach one thousand kilo, one thousand two hundred <laughs> kilometers on ground level, not with a balloon, so not doing okay, three. So but yeah. they're going from Portugal to the Canary Islands with that one. I think is what I mm -hmm. recall reading. So. Um, 1,200, 1,258 kilometers is, uh, is that correct? Miles. All right. Well, then it looks like we have our work cut out for us because we need to break that. How are we going to do 1,259 kilometers? Well, <laughs> Can we do it with a rock concentrator? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I'm sure. 
explains why uh, some of the uh, stuff works from space, right? Because it's well within low Earth orbit and exactly, not quite yeah. not quite medium Earth or orbit, but it's that's awesome. Yeah, it's uh, so it works fine with satellite. Wow. Awesome. The only thing with satellite is you need to change the so th why it needs a different antenna is just because the way the antenna is polarized. So usually you have uh, an antenna standing up on Earth, and then so you expect the signals to be vertically polarized. While in space, you never know how the satellite is orientated. Mm -hmm. So you need in again, it's it's that extra thing that you need to get at long distance. That so polarization is very important. So it, everything in they use everything in RF <laughs> to do it. <laughs> You weren't kidding. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that's actually a good transition into one of the first questions I had is, you know, again, as a novice, I am not a LoRa expert, but that's why I'm joined by you guys. Um, so, yeah, I was wondering if you could just give us a quick overview of perhaps how it works. You know, you talked a little bit about the, the RF um, and, you know, the, the frequency and whatnot, but what is it? from an overall perspective, the overall concept, you've got a gateway and a node, and then they are communicating with each other. Can you give us a little bit of expansion upon that? Since, uh, since clearly that's about all of my knowledge on it. Uh, yeah, that's correct. So they, you need, uh, you get low power nodes on, on usually on battery, very far away. Um, then you have the gateways picking up signals from them and all the gateways typically communicate with the network server. So this is the, so the gateways are kind of dumb. They don't do a lot of processing. They just pick up the data and then send it to somewhere to handle it. So that's, that means doing the decryption, uh, doing the, um, actually finding out if the packet is meant for that network or not, because it can be someone else's. So checking the addresses. Um, and that's the usually the role of the network server, which uh, a lot of people use the, the Things network. It's a free, uh, open, uh, open source server that's available for everyone. Um, and also, there's commercial services out there. There, are, there's other networks like Ilium, do, who also do the same thing. Um, so they basically they provide a service where you connect your gateway to them. They do all the processing you need, the decryption, and then they can feed that data onto your um, web endpoint, like an MQTT endpoint or a, uh, some web socket or a web callback, some kind of thing. So it very, makes it really super simple for any developer to use that data. They don't, you don't need to know uh, like embedded uh, devices to do this. It's all done for you basically in the cloud. Um, I don't know if that's how it's Yeah, that's, that's excellent. Um, and then does it vary based on location? When I started to take a glance at, you know, buying some hardware, um, I noticed there's the different frequencies and different channels. So you, do you have to then stay, there's certain regulations, I suppose, by the, you know, the local governments? Is that how that works? Yeah, that, that's correct. So the, because it operates under one gigahertz frequency there, this the space that is available the, the radio frequency space is uh, changes between countries so each one has its own regulations of how you can use it and which particular spaces of species of spectrum are available so in europe for example we use the 868 megahertz uh, band so this is kind of a, a range of frequencies around this mid, mid band in the us it's different it's 950 megahertz uh, but and it, like the, also the power we can use is different. So in the U.S. we can use a lot more power to transmit, which makes sense because it's such a big country. You don't you don't have uh, so many nodes trying to compete, maybe. So it kind of makes sense. While in Europe, usually uh, it's more dense the networks, mm -hmm. so you you need to to allow more uh, space for other uh, nodes in, within the same area. So in, in Europe, it's actually quite restrictive the the way we can send. But LoRa, with due to its low power nature, it, it still achieves that, it makes it uh, possible to operate even thousands of nodes around one gateway. Uh, Interesting. Okay. Um, maybe maybe I'll mention that uh, there is so the the gateways actually listen in eight different frequencies. This is the usually the the smallest gateways. That's the minimum they do. Uh, 
at the same time, which means they can listen to eight nodes at the same time concurrent, concurrently. So we don't have any um, contention issues with that. Is that the maximum? So wait, eight nodes per gateway? Uh, no, it's a it's a bit more than that uh, because then, yeah, they, it, you the nodes can be using different uh, spreading factors. This is kind of a way the node is transmitting, which uh, you can um, even use multiple of. So it is possible to decode uh, more than eight nodes at the same time, even. But uh, that's that's a good number anyway because. Um, even if the nodes are trying to kind of operate with the same parameters, it's eight at exactly the same time is very rare to happen unless you have a very, very dense network. So it still manages to, that's how you scale up to a thousand nodes, let's say. Okay, so, yeah, I guess I'm envisioning. So let's talk about, so I'm thinking use cases in my mind. And Mark, you showed off that moisture sensor that mm -hmm. you had gotten um, uh, earlier in the show. So what I have in my mind here is let's talk about a farm or an agricultural use case. You wanna deploy those moisture sensors throughout acres and acres of fields and have them all talk and report back to a gateway, but you certainly are going to need more than eight of them. So I can see how, yeah, you would, you would want to have. I mean, I, did you just say up to about a thousand or so is the actual maximum? Yeah, it's difficult to put a number because you're okay. basically dividing up time in time slots. So a transmission takes up maybe a second or less um, to send the data. So you're kind of dividing the available the time uh, on air. For each node so if they if they all try to send at the same time you'll have a problem but because they don't do that usually uh you can uh, you can have a lot more nodes mm. okay so that makes more sense then because i guess i was sort of curious or wondering if you can only deploy up to eight i mean no no not absolutely really, not. yeah you're no you're not really solving for larger use cases so what are okay so the agricultural one, I get that. What are some of the other um, industries that you see um, using using the technology then? Uh, you can use it, industrial is a big area as well now for tracking things. So if you have a lot of assets in one location, uh, like containers, pallets, stuff like that, tracking them is a big application. It's probably the biggest this year, actually. It's tracking. Um, you can uh, measure temperatures for uh, that's one another use case for uh, uh, like heating systems so you can monitor the whole heating system for buildings uh, this way with maybe just one gateway um, there uh, pos I mean there's so many uh, security as well we like seeing alarms on on Laura one now as well like fire fire sensors a lot around COVID as well so there are a lot of applications like seeing if someone is uh, too close, uh, those proximity sensors. So if you have a wide factory, some big area where you need to cover, that's another use case. And then we have like machine uh, machine sensing, so condition monitoring for machines, like seeing if they're they're working or not. Because if you try to this to do, if you try to wire up a factory with sensors, it's actually very expensive. Well, with a wireless sensor with just the battery is something that you maybe you can even magnetically couple to a machine and that picks up your the data you need it's very easy to deploy compared to a wired installation so in factories we're also seeing this kind of use case where um, sensors are being deployed to monitor vibration and temperature in machines so yeah you can use it for uh, lots of things actually uh, but i'd say asset is the big one this year for sure Actually, something as well really interesting. It's uh, Amazon with uh, their project, uh, Sidewalk. I think it's called. Mm. That it's going to use Lora One, right? So probably Amazon is going to get into the smart homes uh, with Lora. What do you think? Uh, I'm not sure if it's Lora One. So, I mean, one thing with Lora is Lora is the modulation. With Lora One is kind of the protocol that involves the network servers and so on. So it might not be Lora. Um, Laura one, but it could be Laura. Definitely makes sense for it to be Laura. So that's something like Ilium is doing now. They are uh, bundling trackers with their service, 
So if you want to track your dog, for example, they provided a small tracker with a very small battery. Just put it on your dog and uh, you can follow him around. <laughs> you know where he is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it can it be as simple as that. It's a good it should idea. cover the whole neighborhood and then some. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you just need something outside, so you can even integrate it with like your uh, video surveillance camera or something like that. Uh, just have the gateway there or you, your Wi-Fi access point. And then you just pick up your where your dog is. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, we have a question that's rolled in. So let me um, get that over to you real quick. It says, how difficult is it to operate and maintain the infrastructure? So honestly, this is probably a good transition point. Um, Mark, I don't know if you were the one that was going to end up doing our build or not, um, or if Jose is going to end up doing it. I think maybe Mark will give it a try first, and we'll see if, yeah. if his electricity holds up. Um, <laughs> if not, then Jose's taken over. But um, you know, looking, let's use this as the as the as the hop off point to start a to start building this thing. Um, so, how difficult is it to operate and maintain the infrastructure? Mark, you want to um, take Mark, a stab yeah. at that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe Jose has more experience on this. Like, so ah. we are going to talk about <laughs> what we are going to show today. It's a do-it-yourself uh, gateway. Okay. So I'm not sure how. Like, uh, so I had experience before on, with professional like curling, uh, Laura gateways. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know if you have more experience on maintaining and operating infrastructure, like a big one. Sure. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I can. Uh, so uh, the problem is the gateways usually run um, some operating system on them. So it can be either a proprietary operating system or it can be like uh, open source, like OpenWRT is very popular with gateways. But actually a lot of people, especially in um, who are in research or are doing trials, they just use a Raspberry Pi with a, with a concentrator card. This, this is kind of the the cheapest way to get into LoRa. Uh, and on the Raspberry Pi, they obviously run uh, Linux uh, Raspbian or something like that. Uh, the problem is they start with um, a few gateways. So they have one or two out there. Uh, it all works fine. But then they find out they need to up update some operating system for maybe security reasons or because maybe the the way the packets are sent has changed or you want to change your um, network server as well. Uh, and then it gets really hard to do because you need to go physically to that place and then open up the box and uh, connect cables and blah, blah. And if this is high up in like a, a roof, which is the ideal place to put gateways, then it gets really complicated. Um, so when you try to scale it, you get you run into these problems. And I think that's where Balena can really help because you, you can remotely manage your Raspberry Pi or your, your Linux computer, basically do remote updates, change variables there, and uh, add new services on top. So it, it makes it really simple. Ah, that's uh, interesting you mentioned that, because I happen to have a Raspberry Pi powered Bellina fin on my roof, and I really don't want to have to climb back up there. Yeah. <laughs> those, those of you who uh, witnessed me put it up there a couple of episodes back um, <laughs> know that. Plus, uh, it's like 150 degrees up there in your yeah, Arizona roof. Exactly, and my concrete tile roof, uh, and I'm in Arizona, is baking. So I really don't want to go up there. So that's ideal. <laughs> Although I suppose I would need to add the concentrator hat. What's to the maximum it. temperature that the concentrator can't reach? Just yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question because the concentrator actually runs quite hot. It's by itself. Uh, it needs cooling, but uh, we have seen it working in Australia. So last year, I think the temperatures reached a bit about 50 degrees, which I'm not sure what's in Fahrenheit. <laughs> sorry. 50 it's degrees centigrade. Yeah. 50? Oh, that's nothing. 50. I, I pushed well over 100 <laughs> centigrade yeah. up there. I, um, yeah, yeah sure. that's, that's not going to. Okay, so that's. Boi it. Boiling point. <laughs> yeah, no, I really. The, the compute module, the Raspberry Pi 3 compute module, the highest I've seen it is at 107.5 Celsius. Um, oh, right. So, yeah, but that's, I'll need a, that's the cheap term temperature. I mentioned the, the environment temperature. Uh, yeah, oh, my environmental yeah. temperature is only 97 yeah. Celsius. Yeah. 
97 Celsius. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hold it, hold it. Yeah, hold it. Okay. So uh, you don't so have any water around, I guess. No, 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 no. Humidity was 3%. Zero. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned right. to just say that you're in Arizona in Phoenix. Yeah, I'm in Phoenix. Oh, Phoenix. right. That Phoenix. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, no. so, okay. Well, yeah, we can uh, handle up to 75 degrees. Usually that's the industrial rated temperature. Um, mm, they're going to have to keep going for me. <laughs> so, okay, uh, we'll have to make a special unit then. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Air con, so. air con. We have another question, actually. Yeah. That's, uh, is the LORAM modulation better than Sigfox? What do you think? Uh, they are different. So uh, Sigfox does something called ultra narrow band. So instead of using a wide bandwidth, they use a much narrow one, uh, which maybe for scaling up to millions of nodes per gateway, it makes more sense. Um, on the lower side, um, it's it's maybe it is simpler for for deployment. So if you are deploying your own networks. Uh, LoRa is probably easier because you can control everything. And that's that's one thing you can't do with Sigfox. Um, but in terms of technically the modulation, I'm not sure which one is better. <laughs> it's nothing. It's it's not a battle that you can actually say one is better than the other. Both have um, applications for sure. Yeah, it's a different use case as I'm related with with your previous previous question, Alessandro. So. It's yeah. If if you don't want to take care of the infrastructure, right? You don't want to operate and maintain the infrastructure, this infrastructure, and you need low mm -hmm. power devices with this long mm -hmm. range. So Sigfox sometimes it's a good uh, choice. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The problem with Sigfox is you often find places that aren't covered yet, and then uh, so you could buy a micro base station from Sigfox, but it's not available everywhere. It kind of you have to still pay for the service, which is odd. So with LoRa, maybe for, especially for private networks, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, what's that? We had a question come in, sorry, so I apologize. We had a question come in from uh, I shot JR about 97 degrees Celsius. So I had my, <laughs> a quick glance at my- Azarus, uh, it's Azarus. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There we go. There it is. 97 your... Celsius, zero degrees humidity, hazardous. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there oh. it is. There it is. So, uh, and you can see that was at 1.30 p.m. Uh, that's a, well, that's over a month ago now. I haven't checked it recently. It might, it may be dead at this point. I'm not sure. But, okay. uh, yeah, do you, I mean, if you can survive in those conditions, uh, by all means, yeah, we could deploy a LoRa gateway here. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's not easy, definitely. Wow. Okay. All right, there you go. So the fin works in those environment conditions. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we should consider it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All, all right. right, should we jump into a, like a demo? What do you think? Absolutely, let's yeah. give it a try. Yep. Say your prayer to the demo gods. <laughs> should we, should I? Uh, last time, last time, no. Matthew didn't pray to the demo gods. Oh, he did not. <laughs> and, All and, right. Uh, it lasts uh, thirty minutes longer than expected, right? Yeah, it's true. So, um, let's uh, let's do it. Let's build this thing. Let me add this on. Uh, let me add my camera, my second camera on the stream. I don't know if oh. you can make it bigger. Yeah, John sure. David. Um, All yours. John, go for it. I'm busy uh, trying to so, figure out where my window went after that 97 degree Celsius <laughs> screenshot. Actually, today we are going to test this uh, rack 2245 uh, concentrator on a Raspberry Pi 4. Okay, I don't know if you can tell more about the, this concentrator. Um, so I'm going to connect this and I'm going to get into the yeah, while he's putting that together, Jose, do you want to talk about mm -hmm. that particular device right there? I see rack. Yep. I see that that one is a hat. Now, I was also mm -hmm. under the impression that they can be purchased in USB or mini PCIe format as well, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So I've got one here. Actually, this is kind of the, 
the mini PCIe unit. So you can, um, this is actually the new one we sell. Um, okay. it, you, you can actually buy a hat to also accept this card, um, which, which makes it more flexible, I guess, but because yep. Uh, what you can change the card to because this is a European uh, concentrated card. So if you want to go to the US, you need to replace this with the US frequencies. Uh, so in, if you have a hat which takes the mini PCIe, it, you can do that more flexibly. But the one uh, Mark has is um, is a very it's most the most popular model, I believe. Uh, it uses the old chipset. So this is the so I mean in in terms of concentrators there's basically two chips now available from the company who, who develops Laura Semtech there's the SX1301 which is the initial one which is the one on Mark's board and now there is a new one called the SX1302 which of course makes sense uh which is a uh, works it's much cooler so it doesn't run as hot so it uses less energy as well um and it's uh, because it's more efficient you can you can use it maybe with a solar panel even uh, that's another idea um and the one i was showing this is the the new module as well it uses that new chipset but yeah but uh, the concentrator is basically so you buy the right one for the region you want to cover uh it comes in the easy to use pi hat format all it uses is spi and uh, basically a pin to reset the concentrator chip so it doesn't use a lot of pins you, are, you still have everything else available it also has a gps because uh it's good to know where your gateway is but also for timing it's uh can be important it does help improve the timing of the gateway um and that's yeah just connect uh, an antenna that is suitable for laura so uh don't don't use a, like a wi-fi antenna that will, you will not get much range from it just get a good antenna for your frequency, and you've basically got a gateway. Awesome. Very cool. Thanks for that description. So, yeah, I see on the one that Mark is showing, yeah, he's got the he's got the hat version there. Um, so, I mean, that's certainly a, a quick and easy way. I'm going to drop the link to that product into the chat so folks can check that out. Yeah, I mean, pretty simple. Snap it right on top of the Raspberry Pi, and away you go. Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right. Mark, you want to continue on? Sure. So what we actually have been working with Shosa last week. It's on the basic station. So on the, on the new packet forward protocol that Semtech, the kind of the owner of Flora, um, created for the new um, for the new gateways. So maybe we can introduce the basic station, Shosa. What do you think? Yeah. So Initially, when Laura was invented, um, someone at Semtech created a very simple protocol, um, which so using UDP, so it was basically took the packets, encoded them in a JSON format, and sent them over UDP to the network server. Uh, that was created more as a proof of concept. Now the problem is uh, Laura expanded very quickly, and that proof of concept code became kind of the official standard for Laura packet forwarding. Uh, although it offers no like safety, it's just unencrypted UDP, uh, and again, UDP is not uh, a reliable protocol, so your packets can get dropped, uh, or someone can impersonate your gateway quite easily so because there's no uh, certificates or encryption at all. So uh, because this, but this is what most network servers still use to this day, uh, unfortunately. Um, but to change this, Semtech created a new protocol called Basic Station, uh, which is based on WebSockets. So this adds encryption. You can run SSL on top of it. It uses TCP, so no longer uh, UDP. And it also, because it uses SSL, you can have certificates that check w if the gateway is actually with, <laughs> it is, it says it is, and also the network server. So we, there's much less chance for um, like someone to do bad things, create fake data on your uh, or create problems for your network. So this is to encourage this. This is a new protocol, so it's not being uh, widely used yet. It is used by the, some commercial operators, so the Things Industries, which is the commercial branch of the Things Network. They they use this already as their default protocol, but uh, 
most networks are still using the unreliable UDP one. So to change this, yeah, that's why I've uh, talked with Mark to create this uh, repository where people can just deploy basic station very easily on the Lena and change, move over to this new thing, which everyone should really be using. Yeah, awesome. And then, yeah, uh, taking the advantage, no, the advantage of Balena no, to manage uh, all the fleet of gateways. Because what I'm learning that a lot of uh, developers from the lower community, they don't have only one gateway. They have a lot of gateways in remote mm -hmm. places, as you said, on the top of roofs or on antennas where they cannot access easily. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting value to have them connected with, with Balena. Uh, so let's uh, actually we we took the basic station um, repository, and we just uh, we balen balenify it. <laughs> good way to do it, to, to yeah. call it, David. Uh, we balenify it. That's pretty much the best way to call it. Yeah. In fact, I just put in. You had posted an article, a blog post on how to go through this, and I dropped it into the chat for the viewers. I'm also going to drop in this repo as well, so folks have the link. Okay. Mm -hmm. There we so actually, go. Actually, oh. in the past, uh, no, I when I tried to use uh, Lora gateways in the past before my Berlin experience. Uh, yeah, you have like a long tutorial. So I wanted to, so since we have this deploy with Valena, I wanted to do like one click on a slower gateway installation. So this is what we are going to try to do. Actually, it's not one click because we need to do the, the things network uh, gateway registration. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's almost uh, one click. So let's oh. click deploy with Valena. And let's see what happens. Let's call it uh, basic station, create a new application instead. Basic, basic station. Actually, today we discovered that basic station in some places are not. Uh, it's misspelled, right? It's with two S. Yeah, there's some confusion around that. Um, so actually, we're gonna copy yeah this repo and with these variables actually with the DCA URI that it's a web socket, the secure web socket that we are gonna use to connect with the, the things network. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's create and deploy. And actually, I will give you access, Jose, to this uh, application, so you can connect okay. your. Yeah. Okay. So we are gonna build a fleet. Uh, so let's. Jose, if I'm not wrong, Jose dot Marcelino. Yeah. So I'll download from so, my side. Oops, cannot find user and define. It's uh, Jose underscore Marcelino. Ah, Jose underscore. Okay, so meanwhile, <laughs> I'm working on this. You can do it as well. So actually, okay. Jose and me, we are going to do the same thing. He's going to add new device, and he's going to introduce his Wi-Fi credentials. So I have a special Valena Wi-Fi at home. Let's see if this works. <laughs> Just to use it on these cases. Um, so <laughs> That's a nice trick. Yeah, I was I was seeing always David worried that Phil <laughs> well, that Phil is Phil is frantically writing down the credentials as we speak. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you always have to create a dummy uh, Wi-Fi. It's a hot spot when you're going live. So actually, uh, what, what we see here is that the, the release uh, from the GitHub repo it's being built in our in the Valena builders right now. I'm downloading the. So I'm burning my SD card now. Wow, you're faster than me then. Oh my god. Lucky you can Phil's see not the uh, you can see the uh, build release um, <clears throat> dialog there in the top middle of the screen, which is it's pulling down from the repo automatically. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Uh... Yeah, That's so I guess to from a high level perspective, from where uh, you were on the blog post or no, you were in the GitHub repo. Either way is going to be yeah, the same. I was on the GitHub repo, but either actually, either yeah. yeah, either will work. You essentially literally just click the deploy with Molina button. It brings you into your dashboard. You create, um, you give it the name and it will fire off a job to run on the Bolina Cloud Builders 
from that repo. Um, in the meantime, you download your SD card image and start bringing the device online. Yeah, it's slow. It's slow we than expected on my side, sorry. But That's probably we will see Joseph's uh, get to be connected. Let's see. This is a kind of a race, eh? Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm uh, my yeah, slow down a little bit as well. Yeah, it's all right. You're lucky. Uh, <laughs> you're lucky that Phil is not on here. He would already be done with this and have his device <laughs> online. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so let's open the well, uh, I still don't have it. Uh, let me see. Last bite. Yeah. Go okay. So flash from from file. Have it here. Yeah. Basic sections. So then uh, select target. Okay. So actually, um, David, uh, what did you write this week on the blog? Did you write about uh, yeah my when my USB get broken by the Yeah, you know I posted a article this week. Um, you know, Etcher we use it day in and day out on our SD cards and our USB sticks and every once in a while obviously things might go wrong so um, I posted an article about how to recover corrupted um, USB or SD cards and I'm just I love that graphic right there the before and the after is it's just okay. amazing by our by our artist um, <laughs> Alexandra she did amazing work um so yeah you know every once in a while a usb stick or an sd card will have a bad flash due to uh you know some data blocks not getting written or a bad partition or quite honestly a lot of times you know some of our more novice users um which is fine but they just don't understand that windows cannot read a linux partition um so they just need to revert back so it's good uh good quick instructional tutorial on how to um resuscitate a uh an sd card or usb stick yeah it's great because yeah last last time that happened that, that those instructions would have helped me like some minutes of uh googling yep so actually i'm pouring up my Raspberry Pi with a rack concentrator. Mm -hmm. let's see. I see a green LED. Yeah, let's see if LEDs are good signal or not. Right now, they should. Uh, it should be. Got handshaking with my router at some point. I'm gonna refresh this to see. Oh, I'm sure. So. Uh, yeah. What is yours? Uh, I'm not made it yet. You're going to win, I think. Sorry. <laughs> it's it's flashing race. now. Okay, so at some point, I, the the gateway should appear here. Okay. So I have a snowy boot. You got what? Snowy wood? That's a, okay. That's a good one. So that should be the Geiger counter for Chris, right? <laughs> That's true. That would have been perfect for him. <laughs> so I'm going to call it Mark. Get ready. So it's unloading the, the image. Um, come over software. OK, so the build completed in the background while we were flashing the device. We powered it up. It's checking into Bolina Cloud, and it's realizing, hey, there's a build, a, a container ready for me. Um, so it's pulling that down now. That'll take a moment as well. In the meantime, Jose, how far along did yours? Is it still? Did I'm you start booting now? Right? Yeah, booting. Booting. Okay. booting. So yeah, your your SD card is already written. Your device is coming online. Okay. All right. Uh, What's the size of that image, Mark? Yeah, how large is the container? I'm not sure. How can I know that? It was the download size was 150 megabytes? Well, that yeah, would have been OS image. that was the operating system. So that was the OS yeah, download. Um, I can know it here on the releases. So I'm purple dust. <laughs> 
purple dust. Hey, I've had that one before. 311 megabytes. There it is, yeah. 311 megs. Okay, so um, not, uh, not tiny, but not terribly sizable either. Um, and then, you know, an important feature to uh, call out here is, okay, this is your initial download of that container. Anytime you make changes to the repo or to the Docker file or push updates down to a device, the Bolina Cloud builders are going to look at what the existing um, release is and then just simply create diffs for um, for what has changed. So any further updates are going to go much qu quicker. It's called Delta downloads. Um, so you know, as you iterate, as you deploy new code, you can actually um, pull down those changes uh, pretty pretty easily. So yeah, it's a bandwidth saver. Um, yeah. You know that instead of pulling all the layers of your containers, it's just pulling the differences and everything after that. So it can save you quite a bit of bandwidth, particularly if you're paying for it with, you know, cell. So, yep. Yep, so cellular yeah, deployment, especially, or if just simply, well, payment is one thing, but for all speed is another. I mean, if you have a device that is really out there and you're on a 2G or 3G connection, um, you don't really want to pull down that 311 megabytes each time. So um, you can save a lot. It's a lot quicker as well in that manner. All right. So That's actually, <clears throat> what we have here, so yeah, the installation here is done. Actually, there is the, the container running. And, and now we, we should uh, go to the Things Network console, create an account, and actually, to to register the gateway, one thing that it's very relevant at the Things Network is to know the UI. Okay, the UI actually gets into these logs. Uh, the UI actually comes from the MAC address of the device with a um, with a couple more bytes because the MAC address is six bytes, and the UI for for the Things Network it should be eight bytes. Um, so actually, it gets here in the middle of the of the logs. But actually, we did a trick. And we as well introduced the, the EOI here on the tags. So actually clicking here, you just copy the UI and it's super easy to uh, to register this gateway on <laughs> under the Things Network console. Okay, so you don't need to to get into the host OS and, and get the MAC address and convert it into the UI or, or just search it on the logs that sometimes can be lost. You have it on the tags. Okay. Mm, and then it's time to go, I imagine, to do the Things Network console. So I would say go to Gateways and click Register New Gateway. Actually, mine, it's already it's already registered. Sorry, I should have deleted this, maybe to do the full demo, but it's OK. Uh, it's connected. Uh, actually, when you, yeah, let me show you how to register a new gateway. So actually, this is a nice trick to understand because we are using like the newest uh, packet forward uh, protocol. We need to click on, and I'm using the legacy packet forward. Maybe just I can tell it more because David just get completely crazy about this checkbox here. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit weird. That's just the way they're doing it now because um, the Things Network is currently on the public side. It's running an older version of the stack. Um, uh, so what they do is they have like a translator, basically, which takes the basic station and translates it to the legacy protocol. That's why they see it as legacy. If you use the new stack, the V3 stack, they call it, uh, you don't need this anymore. It, it, will, it will disappear, that stupid checkbox. Yeah, I said, wait a minute. I don't want to use the legacy one. We're building the newest, latest, yeah. and greatest. No, I'm not that <laughs> makes no sense <laughs> and actually yeah if you copy it from the tag you just paste it here and you have the your eui you just with your description your um yeah as we talked before about the frequencies uh, in my case i should say europe and yeah indoor outdoor and that should work and register gateway but actually mine it's already working here so it's connected and here, the most in, so now just to finish all the installation, what we need to copy it's uh, the gateway ID, 
So I will copy the getaway ID, get here. I go to the device variables. We got these device variables actually um, from the from the repo that we installed. So these are like uh, common application variables for all the devices. The GPS actually I will say it's true. Actually, I don't know you will see something. The get the reset pin it's a eleven SPI speed the DC URI. Actually, if you live in another region. The only thing that you need to do is to change. It's on the documentation, but you need to change EU by US or or the region where you live. Okay, it's on the documentation. There are several web socket, basic station web sockets, URLs for the things network. And actually, I will add two more variables. So I will add gateway ID. This is the one that we copied. And let's go here, and I will copy the gateway key. So I will create another variable. So I will disclose my gateway key, actually. Oh, hang on, I gotta write it down. Oh. <laughs> and now, in theory, uh, the so it has the, the right credentials. It's a stopping because we have new variables, but now it will have the right credentials to to. Uh, uh, wrote properly the the data. So now I have um, just to do the whole test. I don't know, Jose, what you are. Are you as well? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, mm, yeah. Do you want to? Should I share my gateway with you, for example? Because that's possible on the Things Network side. So that's okay. That's, yeah. Uh, let's let's connect one. So I have uh, an Arduino now from the Kickstarter. Okay. So actually, I, I made a, an Arduino code to send random data. OK, so let's see if it works. It's like demo. Fingers crossed. OK, we'll find <laughs> out. Um, now, in the meantime, if that gateway is, in fact, deployed and functioning, and Jose, yours is up and running as well, mm -hmm. um, they're not private. So would we perhaps, if anybody happens to be nearby with a node, could they potentially hop onto it and start transmitting data? Or would you see any other, any other traffic flowing across it, perhaps? Yeah, so that's one side of LoRa. It's open. Uh, so any traffic that gets picked, it gets sent to the network server. And then the network server will decide if it if it's something for it, for for him or not, the, this is decided based on the device address uh, and the key as well. So all the encryption key. There are two encryption keys. So this is all checked, and if the device is registered with the network server, then it will allow it. If not, it just drops it. It's it's just random random data. It doesn't yeah, need. So I have this Arduino Uno here. We can see the traffic. Actually, it's sending data random numbers every uh, 30 seconds. Actually, here we can see the data, if I'm not wrong. Let's see. <laughs> Moment yeah. of, oh, there we are. There so actually, we have a 15, and in 30 seconds, the longest 30 seconds. In, <laughs> yeah, you'll be happy out of it. So <laughs> okay. number. Look at the actually the, I got completely the, nuts uh, doing some tests uh, this morning because I got like the same number three times like oh my god it's not working the random uh, number algorithm on Arduino but yeah that can happen <laughs> <laughs> random, <laughs> random number was the randomness <laughs> random number was not so random but yeah let's see all right we'll see if one more flows in but I it mean yes overall okay. yeah there they go yeah. so, so yeah. the thing with law is that this application you're seeing the data it does it's not tied to a specific gateway any gateway in the, in the things network that could pick up your device will also send data there so that's the good thing about law you get this distributed uh, coverage automatically and also redundancy so if, if you have if you have two gateways in the same place you automatically have that redundancy can you then track that, uh, like if you have a moving uh, device, does mm -hmm. is there a function then to see that, oh, it was handed off from one gateway to another? 
Yes. Yeah, so, so for each transmission, you get you if if Mark clicks on the data, you can see the which gateways picked up this signal. So by mm -hmm. the EY, so it's part of the metadata there, and also you've got the signal level, the, the strength, the signal strength, the RSSI value. So you can even see if it's closer to one base station or the other, for example, and you can even do some kind of basic geolocation based on it. So with the with the dog or cat, we could give our have our neighbors set up their own gateways, and then we could have the dog walk around the neighborhood, and we could track which one, <laughs> which, one the, which, which one, which is the closest, which one they're two timing with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a real world use case. Yeah. yeah, or your cat or something. Yeah, just yeah. move to another house. Like, yeah. Right. Where's chilling out. <laughs> yeah, where's my cat? Get back here. <laughs> well, yeah. It, it's interesting how, you know, adding additional gateways can add additional metadata that gives you even more value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all automatic there. Yeah, actually, but the geolocation on LoRa, it's not very perfect, right? I don't know what resolution it, it gives. No, it's it's not perfect because of all the way the signal is affected. Uh, you can make it better using some uh, very complicated algorithms around the, res the timing the packet arrives at each gateway. But it's it's no idea. It's much for a, like a cat or a dog tracker. You'd use GPS for sure. It's much easier yeah. to do that. Yeah, you oh, can right. send the GPS on the payload. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jose, is yours pulling any traffic or n not finding anything over there? You want to share your screen, Jose? Uh, yeah, Ooh, sure. Did it? Well, I'm just curious if it was if anybody was around transmitting or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, here I, I'm not sure that anyone has a Laura note. Mm -hmm. Let me share my things. Console. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, so this is my basic station. And there's already some traffic because I've got a lot of nodes around me. Uh, all right. well, I, was, yeah, I was curious. I was oh. like, now wait a minute, hang on. It might not be his neighbors. It's probably him. <laughs> yeah, so my neighbors aren't very into lore <laughs> around here. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, now wait a minute, hold on. He's not. <laughs> Here he is. I don't know if he's going to capture anything if there's anyone nearby or again depending on the range if it's you know a few kilometers or not but then I thought mm -hmm. to myself well, he's probably got a bunch of other devices already in there so yeah yeah it's so all the all the time mm -hmm. I yeah. guess you can't. I guess you can't use it for geocaching. <laughs> I just <laughs> yeah, just turned on one now so you can see it. Uh, so this is actually, you can see this icon there on the left corner. So this tells you what the device is trying to do. And this this means it's trying to activate on the network. So it's asking the network, oh, I'm here. I've got this IDs. Can I get an address? It's like a DHCP for Laura. Um, and that's, that's what's happening. So once it gets the address, it will uh, start sending data. But yeah, you can, uh, it's definitely working the gateway. Very cool. So, all right, I'm looking. I'm looking actually, at we have a fleet of uh, we have a, now a fleet of uh, Lora gateways, right? On the yeah. if you go to the Balena cloud and mm -hmm. get into the map, no location. Yeah. Ah, sorry, I, I will share yeah, my screen. Fine. Sorry. Yeah, put your screen back on. Yep, there they are. So that's so what we have I was just one here in the Pyrenees. Yeah, and the other so, one in the UK. Oops. Yep. So not bad. You can start, uh, yeah, managing a fleet of uh, Lora gateways uh, from Balena in just uh, yeah, a few clicks. Yeah, that's. What funny. do you think, David? Do you want to <laughs> start creating uh, Lora network? Well, I like I said, I had considered it. I already have a Balena fin up high. Um, <laughs> high on temperature and <laughs> up high. Uh, Physically, but yeah, I don't know. Unless you can survive 97 degrees Celsius, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm going to be able to do it. We can try, um, but yeah, I want to, you know, certainly make sure. I'm looking at the clock. It's, we're a few minutes over the hour, so I know folks may need to drop off. But um, it was that was pretty amazing. I mean, we just deployed two lower gateways. 
um, two different <laughs> countries. And we can see it there on the map um, pretty easily with just a few clicks. Uh, it was not one click, but it was uh, just two a clicks. few few clicks. I mean, we did it in you know a matter of, I guess we started about 20 minutes ago, 25 minutes ago. So you really can't beat that. Pretty simple. Mm -hmm. From zero to, yeah, to lower yeah. the fleet. But actually, uh, on on the well, on the on the blog post, uh, there is more information. But for the things industries, it's actually one click, because you don't really? need to create the UI. Uh, well, maybe you have to register, but it's basically more automatic than with the things network. And actually, with Helium, it's as well one click installation. Actually, mm -hmm. yeah, very cool. That is awesome. Well. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at the comments rolling in, and I see that uh, people are excited about the screwdriver as well. So this was definitely a two for one episode. You learned about Laura, <laughs> and, and you learned about how to build a Laura gateway as well as an IoT screwdriver. <laughs> Chris, I learned my screwdriver isn't very good. We need to build a fire screwdriver. Screwdriver. That's the next. That's Okay, Chris has his challenge, and Rahul's got a challenge in front of him. Um, but uh, I think we can probably wrap it up here. Definitely thank you, Jose, for joining us. Um, thank you very much. You can see in the comments, learned a ton, learned a lot. Um, definitely appreciate it. Let me grab one last time the link to the blog post and put that in. Um, let's see here. Grab that, put that in so folks have it because there's a lot of good information. Technical difficulties, look for the technical difficulties. There's the uh, GitHub repo and grab the blog article as well. Get that in and we are good. Any last questions? Don't think I see any. John, did you see any other questions roll through that we didn't address? I I didn't. I was just going through there. Um, I think you know if if there are projects and things like that, um, uh, how people are applying the technology. I think that would be interesting to people too. It sparks the uh, imagination on um, how you can use this stuff because the technology is a lot more powerful than it it might seem at first blush and can replace um, some pretty uh, old kinds of things with some amazing capability. I know I look at the stuff and I go, what do I have that I can <laughs> start sensing? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> exactly. Sending data about. Um, and, the, and the rating great. of this technology is that you can run a tiny sensor with a tiny battery. So you don't need like electricity or like Ethernet or yeah. Wi-Fi, etc. Yeah. So Laura, you yeah. can or, yeah, run on solar, so it's simple. Yeah. Yeah, but actually, I have like USB uh, chargers. No, I was trying to charge my phone before when I had, I had power. So actually, I will try to put this Arduino with the sensor and one of these. Mm -hmm. It should last. That's important Somewhere. that your dog or cat doesn't have to carry a big battery around the neighborhood. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Fantastic. Well, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot Thank again. Appreciate it very much, Jose. Um, you're taking the time out and joining us. We'll go ahead and close it out here for the week. Um, next week, um, we actually are going to be talking to Frederick from um, APIC, uh, who does some really interesting work with uh, beehives. It's a pretty cool use case about um, machine learning and AI out in the true wilderness. Um, doing some uh, beehive research. So that's gonna be pretty interesting as well. And uh, close it down there. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thank Bye, you. have a good day or night.